Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. I don't have anything fun to start us off with today. No, nothing good? Nothing good. Well, we'll just have to start off the normal way. Then. We will have to start it off the normal way. Hi, Blake. What's going on, Nick? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. It's episode 131. I just realized we didn't do the intro, so I guess we can start with that. Let's start with that. Hey, it's episode 131. Today is June 3rd, 2019. We're already in the middle of June. I cannot believe that. Uh, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. Hello. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. How's it going, everybody? There he is. Uh, some great news stories today. We're... Uh, um, Gonna also tackle a listener uh, writing in, and you know what? I just have to say, we've been like on a roll with these listener emails lately. Which so it's really, really nice. It's much more fun than picking stuff out of Reddit. It really is. So please, if you have something about the show that you want to contact us about, please write in. That's that's the way to go. It's a way just to uh, we can improve the show that way. It's a lot of fun. We get a lot of joy out of that. So uh, please do send those in. Anyway, we got some news stories today. Uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit lighter on the news this week. I think. Um, but that's okay. Uh, intelligent pedestrian traffic lights. Um, human reflexes helping MIT's Hermes robot rescue robot keep its footing. Uh, I said robot rescue robot. Uh, I just love robots. And then meditation. Robots. <laughs> meditation goes digital in a new clinical trial. Uh, but first, we got some programming notes. You can find us every YouTube on Tuesday around noon. Jeff is usually pretty good about that sometimes. Uh, you know, life gets in the way. I know last week it was on Thursday, but that's okay. I'm sure all of you uh, who are excited to see us on Tuesday, uh, you know, could wait a couple extra days. But he's usually really good about noon Pacific, uh, so check back every noon. Um, and, yeah, I think uh, I think we can jump into the banter. Yeah, have at yeah. it. You showed me some pretty awesome videos okay, before uh, we yeah, started. I did. So, okay, L- what if I told you, Blake, over the weekend I had a unique experience to feel like a Jedi – Oh, goodness. To, it, most people are probably thinking I'm going to Galaxy's Edge at this point. That's yeah. not true. That's not true. I'm really sad about it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I, I got to feel like a Jedi. I got to exert myself physically, and uh, it was in vir- virtual, blah, 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 virtual reality. In the comfort of your own home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, so what did you do? So I played this game called Beat Saber, and um, I'm, uh, I've known about this for a while, and I know it's not new, but... I do have to say that this thing uh, combines three things that I've always wanted. It combines uh, the fun of like a dance class, right? It also combines the feeling that you're a Jedi. Because the okay, the premise behind this game, and we'll throw up some B-roll here, is that you basically have a lightsaber in either hand, and you're supposed to slash these. Uh, it's like a Tar Hero, right? If you imagine the the buttons coming towards you and you have to hit the frets this is like swiping in a certain direction like almost like fruit ninja meets guitar hero if yeah it's you will. very yeah then there's like dance dance revolution in there because it's, yeah. it's very directional it is right? right and it also demands that you are physically active in the sense that it has these uh light barriers that you have to avoid so that's right if one comes in on the right you have to dodge left if one comes in from above you have to crouch uh and still maintain doing all these uh motions with your hands to hit the boxes and so uh, I got this, like, last Thursday night, and it was, like, probably 10 minutes before I usually go to bed. And uh, my partner went into the bedroom and, and said, I'm going to go lay down. I said, okay. So I throw on my headset this first night I got it, and I put it on. And, like, this weird thing happens when you're in virtual reality because you don't have any perception of time. I was in there for, like, 30 minutes with when I only meant to be in for, like, 10. Uh, and... I take off the headset. I'm dripping sweat. And I'm like, this is really weird because I've never played a virtual reality game that has made me like really that has made me exert myself physically a whole lot. So I come out. My face is drenched in sweat. My I have to like wipe down my headset. Uh, My shirt is all sweaty, you know, and I go into the bedroom and my partner's like, what were you doing? (laughs) <laughs> out there lifting weights while you were playing video games right? that's <laughs> so, hilarious because so, you can hear it on the tv right yeah and um so yeah and then the next day i get back in and i'm in there for almost two hours without even realizing it and like looking at my watch later my my fitness tracker later i burned almost 700 calories in the course of like an hour and a half or closer to two hours i guess but like the fact that i lost time 
or lost track of time while I was in there, just having a blast, like just so immersed in it, yeah, mastering these moves, like crouching and then like dodging left and then dodging right. It was, it was a ton of fun, and like I'm a believer now in the virtual environment space of like uh, the exercise piece, right? Like I, I feel like physical activity can happen. I think there's a lot of barriers, right? So I'm like gonna try setting up a fan in front of me because my face gets drenched in sweat. So does that impact your uh, your visual field at all? Absolutely. Or is it like, oh, it does. Absolutely. Okay. So what happens is like my face gets all hot, so the the lenses in the thing fog up, and so like I'm playing and like it's getting fogged up, and I'm just trying to hit the things, and I'm like seeing it, and there will be moments where like I crouch down and it like scoots up. Oh no! It's just like it's it, it, there needs to be a little bit more work on like the mounting front, right? And so like. But overall, it's it's so much fun, uh, and it's just a great experience to kind of come out of that thing and like go look in the mirror, and your entire shirt is just drenched with sweat, and it's like, wow, I didn't even have like I I didn't even feel like that was work. That was just fun. That's pretty cool, man. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a ton of fun. Because there's uh, been like a couple of instances that I've seen like boxing and kickboxing games that are for VR that look pretty. Pretty not like super immersive, but they look right. like they're a lot of fun. And people that are end up doing them, they come away like you're describing. You're basically just soaking wet, like you've gone through a serious workout in like an hour. I just couldn't believe it. Like I, the the amount of fun I'm having like completely outweighs the fact that I'm actually getting exercise in there, uh, which is crazy to me. It's just like I, I don't know. It's not. Um, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced with doing aerobic exercises. Absolutely. It, you look like you were having a blast based on the Instagram post you should. Yeah, I'm not going to post that. <laughs> I'm not going to post that on this week, but I'll, I'll put somebody else up there. That's pretty good. Yeah. What's going on with you, though? Oh, man. So, unfortunately, last Friday, I got pretty bad news about my own automobile, the car that I've had for, like, I don't know, over 15 years. Not so, your baby. Yeah, my, my no. sweet little child no longer is around. Uh, so, I had to go and lease a new car. And Hold what, on. Is everybody okay? Oh, everybody's fine. Okay. Except for the cracked radiator in my car. Okay, all yeah. right. I was but, just making sure. Yeah, no, everything's fine. I should have been driving the car, apparently, for a while, but yeah. eh, lucked out. You know. But anyway, so I just, I so I have never had to think about getting another car because I've taken pretty good care of mine for a long, long time. And Please. when Elise, like, leased her car a couple of years ago, which is a big Subaru Forester, I was like flabbergasted at the amount of technology that's in the car. Like, yeah, because uh, I'm coming for something that was made in like 2002, so none of the electronics really even work in the console anymore. There's no radio sure. or anything like that. And then like getting in her car where she's got stuff that's going off constantly, all the bells like, and whistles, lane detection, and yeah, you know the blindness in the mirrors going off and all that kind of good stuff. Sure. Well, like because my car is a 2019, because I had to go and lease a car uh, just to get to and from work. Um, and I went and got a Subaru as well, but like the amount of tech that is in these things is kind of insane. Yeah. Like I know we talk a lot about on the show about like, um, autonomous vehicles and how cool that would be to be able to like hop in a car and basically have it drive it for you. Well, it, in a lot of ways that already exists in some cars, like with adaptive cr cruise control, I can already set the distance that I want to be from a car. And it's basically driving for me in every way. Does it keep in the lane? It does. It keeps in the lane. Keeps distance from whatever cars uh, that I'm setting it to stay so away. So you from. could like let it go and just yeah. Now you're definitely a little more in the loop, or or maybe I'm just really really nervous whenever I do it. But it it feels like it's it's pretty close to feeling like you're not really driving the car anymore. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, like the the only pieces that are missing from that equation are the navigation piece and being able to uh, find yourself off of a um, off of an on ramp to a freeway or something. But if you're just stuck in traffic, like that is great. What I, I will say, there is like one thing, and maybe maybe you can test this um, because I'm curious if they've kind of fixed this technology. I know um, someone I used to work with said once that they had adaptive cruise control in their vehicle, and uh, you know, on a windy road, if like if the car turns on the road ahead of them and they're on adaptive cruise control, the sensors are pointing forward. So as the car makes a turn. There's nothing in front of you, which means the car is going to speed up. Exactly. Yeah. Does that, that is, happen? That is problematic. I don't really know because I've only used, I guess, basically on straight roads and when okay. I'm going like a constant speed. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if if that would happen because I feel like it would. It would just go straight because there's nothing in front of it for it to worry about. If it's not 
but the odd thing would be is does it how much does it take lane detection into account when it right. does that stuff? Because yeah. it'll go off consistently all the time. Um, wh- even when you're because it it has like a bias, or at least my car does, it has a bias to want to be very close to what's in the middle of the road on the left hand side, so that yellow line. Right. Um, so so what about like in instances like you need to do more testing, you need to do more empirical testing because I'm so interested in this. Like what happens if you're stuck in traffic and like a car slows down in front of you and then pulls out into the next lane and there's all this space in between. Does your car speed up to try? Oh, it'll, yeah, it'll speed up to try and fill the space. Like if, if you're set at 60 or something, like 65 miles per hour, and you're going like 10, 15, and then that other car comes out, does it like rev up and try to get? It's graded. It's not like putting the pedals to the floor. Now, also, too, like the Subarus in general, unless you're like driving a, a WRX or anything like that, like they're not going zero to 60 really quick yeah so there's it's one i think it's graded anyway but it's not like it's gonna be so fast that you can't even gain control of it yeah i don't know i just i'd feel like really uncomfortable if if the car just started accelerating towards like the back end of another car yeah uh all of a sudden you're you're like what's going on yeah <laughs> yeah and it's still really jarring when it does like the adaptive braking stuff like if, okay. it, if it detects something in front of you and it feels like it needs to break it'll do it like really really hard and now they've added a similar feature um for backing up so it'll slam on the brakes as fast as possible if, if it, it detects anything in the way like a small child yeah or a basically dog yeah or... small child is kind of like the baseline for it okay um so so that's pretty jarring but it's at least it, i guess the safety features are there but it's not perfect by any means look at you backing into small children saving lives i know it's nuts <laughs> absolutely nuts well that's cool i i definitely want you to go do more empirical testing and report back because uh that's something that my car doesn't have and it's 2015 and uh something i want yeah it's cool stuff man i can't <laughs> believe the stuff they put in cars i know all right well you know what time of the show it is what time is it it is Time for Human Factors News. This is part of the show where we break down everything related to the field of human factors. This could be anything related to what? Medical. Uh, what else we got in there? We got medical. We got some robotics Transportation. Going on. Yep. And yeah, transportation. We uh, and we got some like mindfulness in there today. It's like, it covers all the bases. Yeah. Every base. All right. So what do we got up first this week? So kicking it off first this week, we got two... Two or TU Graz Institutes of Computer Graphics and Vision have developed a new pedestrian traffic light system in the last three years, which is more convenient and meant to replace the current push button system. So the innovative camera based system recognizes the intention of pedestrians to cross the road and switches the light to green automatically. And what's more, it helps to actually optimize traffic flow. So, for example, a light could be in green phase and it can be extended in the case of a large group of pedestrians trying to cross who require more time to get across the road. And if people wait, leave waiting, leave the waiting area before the lights have turned green, this is also passed on to the lights or recognized by the lights. So the traffic lights can subsequently not be as long. And so there's no necessary, unnecessary waiting times for any motorized vehicles. So this is all done using global movement models and recorded data that the research team has developed learning algorithms around, which actually recognize pedestrian intentions to cross the street. So this is pretty awesome, Nick. I mean, this is taking, you know, what we've talked about before of kind of like smart cities and ingesting all of this data through just cameras and putting a model to it and basically trying to not only optimize like a a pedestrian's experience when they're trying to cross the street or if they're in a new city, but also keeping traffic flow going. Yeah, this is really neat. I, I'm i always kind of looking for these City of the Future articles. Um, and the fact that this can kind of detect intent just from a camera is really neat. Um, that's a lot of information that a camera has to parse. And uh, I love that we're at the point now where we don't need specialized sensors we don't need like facial recognition technology we just it, it's a camera yeah it's very simple and now you're not even really necessarily requiring anybody to push any buttons or do anything just I, it kind of seems like end up in a wait box and then the camera is able to tell like okay this person would like to cross the street what can i do to help them yeah and i i the the thing that i like is that it is adaptive so like if it sees another person trying to get to that intersection it will extend the time so that person can cross it's like where's the cutoff though um and how do you make that to optimize traffic flow as well to reduce idling right because people can wait cars 
are going to pollute more if they're idling. Like there's there's all these considerations too that I'm thinking about. It's like how do you optimize traffic flow? And obviously you prioritize pedestrian safety, but like you know, when do you cut it off to to reduce the total idle time? I I don't know. There's there's people smarter than me trying to figure this out right now. And um and I wonder if, like, in the algorithm itself, if it's taking into account kind of these trade-offs you're talking about. I don't know if it does. I think this this specific example is just looking at, like, trying to extend that that walkway. I'm just opening up a whole can of worms into a bigger conversation, I'm sure. But, like, I think this one's just looking at how to optimize pedestrian cross-traffic because you have um, monitoring intent of a person on a corner looking for additional uh, stragglers that are going to come in, Um and what's cool is that, like, if it sees a big group coming towards it, it can basically start the countdown and say, okay, this is the cutoff, right? And say, like, okay, I see more people coming in, but after that, we're done. Um, and maybe that can feed into the idling. They can almost start projecting how long it needs to either start adjusting the time for the lights to slow everybody down or anything like that. So it's it's a pretty cool system for sure. And to bu- to be only kind of transmitted through cameras and, of course, with aid of kind of rec- mo- just general model recognition, it's pretty intense that this could both be helping pedestrians and, uh, like, motorists as well. Yeah, you know, this is going to sound like such a... I, I, don't, I don't know how to... I don't even know how to phrase this. Uh, the thing that I find interesting and... Uh, okay, so this is going to be installed by the end of 2020 in Vienna. Why is it taking that long? <laughs> like, it's just such a, like, I, I guess, you know, you have to install the stuff, but it seems like a pretty simplistic job is, like, hook up the cameras to the system and hook wire the system up to the lights. I don't know. Like, yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, what was going to take so long and where have they done kind of the testing for it? Because in, here in San Diego, at least, or even just in the area that we're in, I feel like it wouldn't take very much, in le- except for the maybe the politics of being able to use traffic cameras that already exist, or like so maybe the, or yeah. well maybe the infrastructure is just not the same. Maybe there's not enough cameras that you could, not enough cameras either installed in the right place or at all that you could leverage to use for this type of technology. That's fair. Yeah, I, even just installing cameras and hooking, I, like I guess, I guess. Still though, it's it's cool to see that this technology is going to be implemented by end of next year um like we're we're living in i don't know like this is this is like we're living in 2020 and we still don't have automated crosswalks yeah i mean we're i think everybody's (laughs) still trying to catch up with like how do we get Uh, rid of antiquated systems or what really actually needs to be replaced so i I don't know this is a good test case right because if they start seeing like less you know, less accidents or, you know, pedestrian fatalities or anything like that. The The cool part about having cameras like this, even though we've talked about the privacy issue a thousand times on this show, is that you can keep helping the, I guess, algorithm learn consistently and get a little bit more information and maybe make better decision making over time and kind of learn from its own mistakes or mistakes that people make and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I. I'm I'm still like uh, it's 2020. We need we need flying cars. Like what what gives? I don't yeah. know. About Why are we still walking? Something about 2020 gets me. I don't know what it is. It's like right now it's 2019. 2020 is that threshold. Like the future needs to be here. I, In six I months. Know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> well, it's coming. It's it's just pretty slow. All right. What do we got up next? All right. So up next, a little bit of MIT action. So MIT's Biometric Robotics Lab is pushing the meddling of human and machine even further in hopes of accelerating the development of practical disaster robots. So with support of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, they are building a telerobotic system that has two parts. So a humanoid capable of nimble dynamic behaviors and a new kind of two-way human machine interface that sends your motions to the robot and the robot's motions to you. So if the robot steps on debris, and starts to lose its balance, the operator feels the same instability instinctively and reacts to, f- to avoid falling. Then they actually capture that physical response and send it back to the robot, which helps you to evolve far- falling even further. So through this human-robot link, the robot can harness the operator's innate motor skills and split second reflexes to keep its footing. So future disaster robots will likely have a great deal of autonomy, 
And someday they hope to be able to send a robot into a burning building to search for victims on its own or deploy a robot at a damaged industrial facility and have it locate which valve it needs to shut down, shut off in order to save people's lives. So they're nowhere near this lo- that level of capacity and hence the growing interest in teleoperation. Nick, teleoperation is something that I feel like I've dabbled with since grad school or at least talking about it. And now that it's getting into something as kind of advanced and having DARPA behind this makes me kind of no doubt that it's this advanced, but basically being able to translate motions and kind of feelings or, or I guess like pain points in your own body between a human and a robot, it seems pretty advanced and pretty far ahead of its time. Yeah, I I think this is really cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I mean... The- <laughs> The the biggest thing is like with telerobotics, the the lack of feedback uh, for the human operator is largely the uh, one of the drawbacks. Right, is that you have to have these feedback system feedback mechanisms that help support the operator's tasking. Now, uh, like let's say in the example in the article here, they use a uh, this guy swinging an axe to control the robot, right? And so you see him swinging the axe, and presumably he gets that feedback uh, from the exoskeleton suit that he's wearing, uh, which, by the way, if you haven't listened already, we do have an audio-only podcast for uh, the exoskeleton's webinar. It's really neat if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, that plug aside, like, so he's presumably getting feedback from the exoskeleton that the axe has hit the wall. Um, and you know, in other systems, this might be like a haptic jab. Uh, but even that haptic uh, like buzz or vibration in the control might not have given them the appropriate feedback, right? Like the system will lock if the robot locks in this setup here, whereas you know the, the operator could basically put the axe through the door in the other scenario with just the vibration. So the big advancement here is that the human is getting that feedback from the robot's perspective, and it's almost like, that human is getting that same um, uh, physical environment that the robot is in, but is in a safer environment, right? So they also mention in this in this blurb that you know if if the robot steps over something, um, you know, like an uneven surface, the human will that that will translate into the human as well, and they can the human can serve to sort of act reflexively to save the robot's balance as well. Um, and that's cool too, because if you think about it, robots are not the most limber things, right? And eventually we'll get there with artificial intelligence, fine, whatever. But right now we still need these human operators to do it. And so this is just one more advancement in that area. Yeah. Cause I mean, we're walking around with so much just evolution going on in our motor system that trying to translate that into just to a robot would be really difficult in any other situation, except for what we've got right here. And I, th- I think you're right. The awesome part about Hermes is that it's actually, you know, not just giving you vibrating feedback or haptic feedback for when something happens, but it's, it's kind of locking you in place. Like, like you showed with the ax and the door, I would assume that the exoskeleton would almost not let you go anywhere from there, which helps you understand, okay, this is the situation it's in. Um, and one thing that I would like to know is how well they're able to deal with the latency issue because that's a big problem in te- Intel operation. In it general. absolutely is, and and especially when it comes to like the reflexes, right? Like yeah. that. How does that work if the robot, even if it's delayed by, um, you know, point two five seconds, that's enough to offset it. Like the robot's already down by the time the human operator. Yeah, he'd be falling down for sure. Now, something where it's kind of interacting with things, as long as it's like if it was in a burning building and, you know, the robot was built in a way that allowed it to deal with like higher flames and stuff like that, maybe it'd be all right. But like stuff like walking or the danger of falling down based off of uneven terrain, I think that gets a little more difficult. But you could potentially have operators for the moment anyway, or in the near future in the area, maybe in a mobile vehicle that has the sensors hooked up for this kind of stuff. Yeah, I it's just fun to watch this thing like the human operators uh like manipulating this robot and getting the feedback. It's um I guess the future's now 2020. <laughs> like this yeah. is this is kind of cool. Like I I don't know. I, I I just I see some issues with it, especially with like like the latency like you said, uh but it would still be I I want to see this in practice. Yeah, cuz if mean, this saves lives 
No, and, absolutely. I mean, you could this could not only save you know people's lives in the firefighter situation, but it could save firefighters' lives. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So there's a lot of awesome applications. The the one thing that I think is super interesting too is you talked a little bit about AI, and I mean, this is the stepping stone to get us to the place where you know the robot is starting to learn like in certain terrain. Okay, this is the the reflex that Nick would have if he was walking. Um, right. Maybe I'll just use this here because I've been in similar terrain. So over time, I mean, I feel like just just like we were talking about with the last story, using you know uh, a nice library of like visual representations of how people interact. I feel like the same principle can be applied to this kind of scenario. Yeah, does it build that? Does this feedback to an artificial intelligence system that then learns to to develop actual robots? I think that's that would be a great next step for sure. And hopefully they're already thinking about it. Oh, I'm sure they are knowing <laughs> MIT for sure. Yeah, they're always two steps ahead. All right, so we're going to be take a quick break, and we'll be back right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener-supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc., we're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. All right, well, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at 2 Graz, Science Daily, IEEE, and IEEE Spectrum for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles, and we post those as we find them. And sometimes they're even sourced from you guys. So, yeah. which is so fun. It really is. I love our Slack. If you haven't, if you're not a member of our Slack community yet, please jump in there. It's it's a ton of fun just hanging out with a bunch of other human factors people. Um, all right. What's up next? We last got one story. More story. Yeah. Last one. All right. So scientists at UC San Francisco have developed a personalized digital meditation training program that significantly improved attention and memory in young adults in just six weeks. So the intervention is called MetaTrain, use li utilizes a closed-loop algorithm that tailors the length of meditation sessions to the abilities of the participants. So they're not discouraged by their initial attempts to focus attention on their breath, a time-honored meditation technique. So the mag magnitude of the effects on the attention and memory, which were unexpected for healthy young adults, were similar to what's been seen in previous studies of middle-aged adults after months of in-person training or intensive meditation retreats. So the app-based program, however, required just 20 to 30 minutes of cumulative practice each day, composed of many very short meditation periods. So the researchers said that Meditrain holds a promise for a younger generation that is accustomed to digital devices, but faces multiple challenges to sustained attention from heavy use of media and technology. I don't think a more true statement could be used, right? We're definitely very much more familiar with using this kind of tech on a daily basis, but it does detract a good bit from our attention. Um, so Nick, do you do any kind of meditation or use any of that kind of stuff? I don't do meditation. I don't do mindfulness intentionally. Uh, I feel like I do a lot of what mindfulness is, um, not intentionally, you know, like I, I unintentional mindfulness, unintentional mindfulness. I feel like I do that, uh, without calling it mindfulness. I do take time to kind of reflect on what's going on in m my psyche, uh, at any given point, but I don't consider it mindfulness. Uh, however, uh, I, I know you kind of dabbled in this stuff, right? Oh yeah, I, I dabble a little bit in it, and it's this will be if if they release Metatrain, which I'm I'm hoping they do. I'm hoping it's just like oh, an app sure on the will. App Store. Um, because I've played with a lot of different meditation apps, like I've used Waking Up recently for a, a long time. Um, but it's it's kind of interesting that they've they're throwing a different kind of training paradigm in there, where it's like twenty or thirty minutes, but spread out throughout the day, versus trying to just do it all in one go. Um, so th that's pretty cool, and it's interesting to s see. And of course, it'd be great to dive into some of the details of what improved attention and memory really means in just six weeks and in just this small amount of time. But that's an awesome effect for people that, 
you know, are like our age or younger that are dealing with having using technology all the time and maybe your attention feels stretched thin. I found that, you know, meditation or mindfulness, whatever you want to call it, sitting there in silence and just breathing for a little while, if you will, um, it, it can help with focus or being able to kind of calm your mind. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely think I do a lot of this in the car, but if I had a guided app that would like kind of teach me to do it, um, that'd be interesting. I, w- I want to I want to jump into some of the details here. So um, MetaTrain gives everyone regular feedback, progress reports during the training sessions and each day of the training and at each uh, end of the week. So they're oh, giving cool. like frequent feedback on everything. Um, so the, the thing that they uh, kind of point out here is that they give a lot up front. And I think they're thinking that's why this might have such a huge impact. Um, so on the first day, participants could stay focused on their uh, breath for an average of only 20 seconds. After 30 days, that rose to an average of six minutes. So that is a staggering, like, It's a fair amount of time, yeah. Yeah, and uh, let me see if I can find the specific quote here about um, the early intervention here. While I'm doing that, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, required just 20 to 30 minutes of cumulative practice each day. Uh, composed of very many short meditation periods. In the beginning, participants were prompted to pay attention to their breath for just 10 to 15 seconds at a time. As they improved over the six weeks, the application challenged them to increase the amount of time they could maintain focus, which averaged several minutes after six weeks. Um, And they said this isn't like any, this is not like any meditation practice that exists right now because they are looking at sort of this micro uh, sort of aspect of it. Yeah, they're just focusing basically on like a breath technique as well. So that's a, that's a little bit different than some things you you will see in other meditation practices. But this is pretty great that I mean you're able to see that big of a jump in just attention span. Um, and I wonder if I wonder if like at 12 weeks, what do you really see? Do you see any kind of like in, enhancements in the way you feel or the way you're you're able to attend to different things? Or if this like helps with other kind of secondary issues, right? Like your mood or anything like that. Yeah, for sure. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I would be happy to try this if it when it comes to market because you know it will. They patent it, so it's oh, definitely. it's coming. It's coming it's, with a subscription yeah. service. I'm sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's probably going to be a free version that lasts like a week or something, and and then you have to pay. But whatever, you know. It, if you, if you want to be more mindful, that's one way to do it. All right. Any other thoughts on this one before we move on? If you want a little more attention? <laughs> uh, no, that was pretty good. I liked it. Okay. Yes, that's that's it. Pretty uh, pretty pretty basic news stories this week. Not a whole lot, like I said. But we got something else. It came from. It came from. That's right. It came from email again this week. This is the part of the show where we kind of like to do community outreach. And you know what? We consider email uh, the sin- most sincerest form of community outreach yep. because it comes directly from you guys, the listeners, uh, who are listening to us and supporting us. So we want to give back. Um, this one comes from uh, AK. So uh, here's the thing, Blake. What you got there, Nick? On our YouTube channel, we have been posting all of our older shows. Now, this these all the way back. to the, You remember the days when we kind of did our lecture series? Oh, I do. I uh, I very very much remember. We spent doing a lot that. of time and effort on those episodes, and um, you know, it, of course, we tend to miss some things sometimes. And uh, AK so generously wrote into the show to um, kind of this is about the ergonomics misconceptions episode, just so everyone knows. Um, Dealing specifically so, with rockets, right? No, no, no. That just was in general. Just in general, yeah. No, th- let me read this. So. Uh, AK writes, uh, saw the Human Factors cast, episode 30, Rocket Science Today, and was quite impressed. Subscribe to your YouTube channel. I then browsed earlier Human Factors cast and thought episode 22, Ergonomics Misconceptions, would be interesting. I'm sorry to say, though, that it it was very interesting. There were many bits that were very disappointing. So uh, I want to um, call out some of these points that this listener disagreed with because, look, we're not going to – we're not going to sugarcoat it. Like, we can't be perfect all the time. Absolutely not. This is a show – for human factors practitioners, and sometimes we miss the mark, and we want to be upfront about that. Well, yeah, and I think it's important to note, and I feel like we definitely w- covered this in that episode, but we I don't think we covered enough uh, in the last few. Like, we're, we're human factors practitioners, and we have a background in human factors, 
but that does not in any way make us qualified to talk about every possible <laughs> human factors topic. Yeah. So it's it's just one of those things where we do we do our best and try and find experts to bring onto the show to talk about all this kind of stuff. Yeah, or um, or people who are more versed in in the topic than us. So absolutely. I mean, like you know, it's honestly this is a platform for us to hang out and talk human factors. It's like uh, you know hanging out with your human factors buds every week and just kind of. Oh, yeah, look at those news stories. That'd be cool to talk about with somebody, and, and we're those people. So uh, anyway, um, I do want to go through some of these, though. So I think what I'll do is I'll kind of read uh, the points that they disagreed with. Absolutely. And then we can chat about it. Let's do it. All right, so let's let's start with this first one here. Are human factors and ergonomics the same? So this is a topic that we addressed. Uh, the opinion expressed was that ergonomics, as a part of human factors, and uh, this listener felt that they are complementary, ergonomics deals more with the physical aspects while human factors deals more with the cognitive aspects. I feel like we said that in the episode. Yeah, it makes me want to go back and listen to or or interact with the listener through Slack maybe. Yeah, uh, if about you're listening. where the okay. dichotomy happened there because I I feel like I feel like they can be in some way synonymous, but we definitely I mean that's why we brought at the time Woodrow on the show to come yeah. talk about it. Cause he was much more versed in the ergonomic side of like the ergonomics and human factors marriage than, than I am certainly. Yeah. Um, but I totally agree with this statement that he's, that AK is made, right. That ergonomics is dealing with the more physical aspects. Cause that's like physical product design or area design. Um, and then human factors is really thinking about some of the more co- cognitive things or nowadays it's a lot of like software engineering and stuff like that. Yeah, I feel like we touched on this in the episode, but I do want to say like, you know, it, I, I feel like what may have happened is there. I may have say, said like a blanket state or somebody may have said a blanket statement. It's probably me. Uh, but, you know, it's like, hey, you know, human factors and ergonomics, it's the same thing. But ergonomics is, uh, you know, about the physical design and then uh human factors is the cognitive aspect i may have said something like that that sounds like something i would do they're the same thing it's the same, it's the same. but but okay yes i i agree that that nuance there is is important to distinguish right if you're just listening that was bad information for somebody who might not know the difference yet so sure and i think it, it is important to think about the fact that like we when we've gone to like HFES, that's a perfect example where human factors and ergonomic society, right? They're very much married together because I think yeah. one kind of has spawned out of the other one and they grow and change and all that kind of stuff in terms of like the science and the application consistently together. So even though they are they are like focusing on kind of two very different things, I think at the end of the day they are like one in the they go together very well. They, yeah. They are complementary, but human factors deals more with cognitive and ergonomics deals more with physical. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next point here was, is ergonomics all about adjustability? Um, one got the impression that adjustability is good if you can afford it, but there are situations where adjustability doesn't deliver, such as height of a door or the location of a switch uh, where one goes by percentiles or where there has to be different sizes, such as gloves and safety gear. Um, so... Uh, they they do mention that we mentioned this in passing. So I think the main point here is that we were basically raving about adjustability. Adjustability is the future, you know. But but in certain cases, <laughs> you know, like if you can adjust it, adjust it. But that's not always applicable. There are some instances, like they point out here, like doorways or switch, that can't be adjusted um, for all populations so you use percentiles yeah you use like the minimum right. max of the percentile or of the population based on like the do- if it's a door you want to accommodate the person that is in the max right 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 the, um, the average or the yeah the 98th percentile that gets 98 percent of the people that are going to walk by that switch uh they'll be able to accommodate or you know y- you make a door that's going to get 98 percent of the population and that two percent has to duck down yeah know, to, to get through um, but yeah, so so that's important too. And uh, while we did mention it in passing, I think it is important to sort of bring it up as its own separate issue. Absolutely. Okay, up next. Are keyboards associated with carpal tunnel syndrome? All right. The opinion expressed was that work with keyboards causes pinching of the median nerve. So the answer is yes, keyboards do cause carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, so AK's take on this is that uh, very few studies have found uh, carpal tunnel syndrome in computer users, but there are lots of cases in industrial operations like assembly, meat cutting, forestry, dentistry, uh, where force along with bent wrists and vibration are present. Probably tendon-related musculoskeletal disorders like tendonitis, or I'm going to mess this one up, tenosynovitis. 
Tenosynovitis? Uh, I'll allow it. All right. Are more common in computer users. So we just we got some terms mixed up here, and the specifics can be important, right? Because carpal tunnel syndrome is different from tendonitis or tenosynovitis. I'm going to struggle with that word. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm going to do a quick Google search here. What, what uh, the difference is to you, Blake? I have no idea what the differences are. I do agree that you might see a lot more of the cases of CTS coming out of some of the industrial workers. I mean, like, especially all I can think of is like, if you're using a drill, like, a, and if you're like a mechanic where you might have to get your arms into kind of some weird funky configurations. Um, but I will, I mean, it, I feel like this is a very case by case basis thing. Cause I, and this is again, anecdotal in a one, but I at least know two or three of our own core workers who have gotten CTS and they do nothing with power tools and they only have gotten it from interacting incorrectly with their keyboard or their mouse situation. Sure. And they rectified it by changing that or having like more ergonomic tools, whether it's a mouse or a keyboard or some combination. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this was just kind of like an overclassification on our part. Like we just said carpal tunnel syndrome, but really there's these nuances like tendonitis um, is the tissue connecting muscle to bone and then tenosynovitis is the tendon sheath where the muscle connects to bone. Uh, you know, those those are different from something like carpal tunnel, um, where the uh, caused by pinched nerves. So it's it's uh, it's different. Kind of the difference in where you're feeling it and where it's actually manifesting itself, or what's causing it. Yeah, I think that might be. You know, we may have overclassified that, and uh, potentially, yeah. 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 All right. Getting all of our skeletons out of the closet. Absolutely, here. Uh, bring them out. I love this. I I love emails like this um, because you know, like w we just do our best we can. But honestly, like emails like this really kind of inform me, and I'm I'm learning something by going through this and addressing it in a public manner. And hopefully, others can too. Like, hopefully, our our mistakes can help other people learn. And uh, well, at I, the same time, I think it's great for for me anyway, to highlight the where a lot of my lack of knowledge is in terms of like biomechanics or ergonomics yeah, in general. For sure. Um, so this is, I don't know, this is really great. I'm glad that AK was able to write all this in for us to go back and talk about. Yeah, all right. The next one here, lift with your legs is a bad rule. Um, so they were actually really happy to hear this major ergonomics misconception being talked about, even though it wasn't on my list, my Nick's list. Uh, so I don't know why it wasn't on my list. I guess I just never heard of it um, before this episode. So they go on to write, what is disappointing is that the situation which exposes the major flaw of this rule was not mentioned. So, you know, although we said don't lift with the legs, uh, we failed to mention when not to lift with the legs. So when the size or the dimensions of the loads become very large, it often doesn't fit between the legs. Um, so in order to keep the back straight, one is forced to hold the load far away from the body and the effect of moving the load uh, far away from the body multiplies the load momentum and the effect on the back muscles. So many, many times uh, and far outweighs any benefits of keeping the back straight. So this is interesting because we didn't, we didn't describe the situation. So imagine there, you're there, uh, you are trying to lift something that you can't put between your legs, right? If you, if you could lift between your legs, you would just lift with your legs. Uh, and because this is further out, you are putting more strain um, on your back muscles when you're trying to lift with uh, a further, um, man, I don't even know the, the ergonomics terms here, but the, like the moment arm is so far out that you don't have the correct force to lift it. And so you're putting unnecessary strain on your back. To do yeah. It. I could see that. Cause I mean, now if you're like, if, if you're able to lift something for your legs, you're able to, you know, use the, I don't know, the strength that you're able to hold and by pinching your shoulders, but if you have to reach out like this, you've lost all that. You can't you can't do that, yeah. So, yeah, so you're just you're kind of I don't know, gaining slack in your back, if you will. And then trying to like keep your hips under it or anything like that. Right. It's gonna make it super difficult for you to keep your back in any kind of good position. Hey, remember this. Lift. Remember this. You're moving soon, I'm moving soon. Let's keep this into uh yeah. consideration. Yeah, weight belt for me. That's what solves yeah. problems. I don't know. That's another question. Like, if any of you are ergonomic, I know AK here, you have a, a, a history. Um, if you can write in, please let us know if weight belts work. Is that is that something? I don't know. That's, that's interesting. Um, Definitely a trained skill for sure. Yeah. All right. Repetitive motions are among the top five ergonomic issues. 
Uh, so they go on to write, this further reinforces the major misconception that ergonomics is all about repetitive work. Yes, repetitive motions are bad, but static contractions are mus- much worse. Uh, the key risk factors for musculoskeletal injuries have to be forced, bent wrists, static contractions, cold, and vibration, along with repetitive motions. So, yes. Absolutely. I think this, this again, could have been anybody. or wait, It could have been me. It could have been you. I think this was another blanket statement issue. It was right? definitely you. Oh, I'm awesome. just kidding. I'm kidding. I don't know. It was probably me. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this makes sense to me because yeah. I think what I've heard the most in my very little experience in, like, I'm talking grad school textbook stuff about ergonomics is the talk about repetitive work and the impact that it can have. But it, this brings up a lot more factors that I would have not really thought about. Bent wrist is about the only one, and vibration, it, the only two that I've really heard of before would make the connection just offhand. So I feel like this could be another blanket statement issue. Yeah, this makes sense to me. All right, ergonomics and safety. Yes, certainly. Ergonomics contributes to enhanced product and system safety. This could be improved uh, design, by, such as adhering to principles of control design, matching layout and displays to mental models, and uh, application of anthropometry and biometrics. So that's interesting. I don't know what this is specifically in reference to because it's been a long time. Uh, we're like 100 episodes out from episode 30. <laughs> I guess this is episode 22. So this is... We're, yeah, we're what? 132 <laughs> out? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a long way out. But yeah. uh, I, think, I think this is a good point to make, right? You, you basically want to match your layout to displays and mental models and then also... Uh, keep in mind anthropometry and biomechanics when you're putting those uh, controls in places where the operators are going to have to reach. Like, think about a cockpit. You are putting controls in a place where they're going to be easily accessible from the operator's biomechanical uh, movements uh, and the anthropometry (laughs) of the uh, pilots. So that's something to consider as well. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think this one I'm having a harder time both pulling out what the criticism is, but because I mean, this sounds very reasonable to me by any stretch of the imagination, especially if you're designing some kind of physical layout in addition to like having UIs or interfaces that you have to deal with. Um, yeah, so maybe it's just an additional point. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, the 2020 20, 20 rule. Okay, so we use the 2020 20, 20 rule. Uh, they were very delighted to hear this simple but effective rule mentioned. They weren't so happy to hear that the 10-10-10 rule might be equally as good. Uh Uh-oh. After all, the look uh, 20 feet away is meant to relax the eye muscles by focusing on a distant object, and they're doubtful that the 10 feet would be effective for that. Uh, And they go on to write, of course, those are their personal observations, and Woodrow might feel differently. So we had Woodrow on the show for this episode, uh, and I do I do remember him bringing up the 10-10-10 rule, and I think it was kind of like mentioned in passing, if you can't do the 20-20-20 rule, maybe just try the 10. So this might just only be for my benefit, but in case somebody else is listening and doesn't know what the 20-20-20 or 10 oh, yes, 10, please, 10 please, rule is, please, please, what, are we ta- uh, what are we talking about here? Okay, yeah, so the 20-20-20 rule is every 20 minutes, look uh, out at a distant object 20 feet away for 20 seconds okay and there this we go. is to reduce eye strain and um fatigue while looking at a monitor right so if you have like a window make sure you look out the window at like a object for 20 seconds every 20 minutes and that will keep you know your your focus and your eyes uh healthy basically because i definitely you, don't do that i don't either i should try that um i do something that's a little similar i kind of like get up every every hour at least and walk around the building um it's not every 20 minutes obviously but i feel like i lose concentration i was doing every 20 minutes yeah no kidding it's like 20 minutes although i am in your office (laughs) but but anyway so (laughs) same thing with the 10 10 10 rule so for it would be 10 feet every 10 minutes yeah and and so so for 10 seconds i think uh you know, okay, what if we compromise here and said like 20, 10, 10? You know, you look 20 feet away every 10 minutes for 10 seconds. I think the the main um the 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 main criticism here is that the 20 feet away is meant to relax the eye muscles uh, by focusing on a distant object. And it's not so much with the frequency. Yeah. 20, 20, 20 is just um easy to remember, right? So, you know, if you're if you're 20, 10, 10, that's probably even better for your eyes, honestly. Uh, but I think the, the issue here is with the 10 feet away. So don't look at 10 feet away um, unless literally you are trapped in a podcasting studio and the only thing away is 10 feet, and that's the only it, thing you can focus on. It's not even. 
Yeah. It's like no, five. It's probably like five feet. Yeah, it's a small we're, studio, we're in guys. Trouble. I know it looks pretty spacious in here, but really, we're in a small studio. It's very small. Uh, anyway, so, um, you know, th- of course, those are their personal observations. Uh, so they also write in suggestions for future Human Factors casts, uh, which include computer vision and, and eyeglasses, yes. bifocals, and conventional progressives are bad, immediate distance lenses, and occupational progressives. So we actually don't do the lecture series anymore, but. I feel like we tackle a lot of these uh, c- types of uh, topics when some of the news stories comes up. We've so. definitely had more computer vision and kind of the industrial application of some of these like systems like the HoloLens or Google Glass, like we, which I think was last week. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'd love to break down bifocals and conventional progressives and why they're bad. Yeah, well, thank you, AK, for writing in. Uh, AK is from India, so uh, we want we want to hear from more of you. If you guys have criticisms about the show... Please write in. Or, you know what, if you just want to say we're doing a great job, we like that too. Uh, We prefer that. But you know what, if you have anything, just write in. We love hearing from you. That's going to be it for today. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Uh, You can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at 8Tractors Podcast. If you want to write us in, like AK did, you can write us at show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice. That really helps us out with word of mouth. And special shout out to the Redditors who, uh, you know, they they uh, mentioned us on uh, one of the Reddit threads on the user experience. Oh, that's about, right. That was a big deal. About great podcasts. So I'm, sur- I'm sure some of you are, are here because of that. So thank you to the Redditor who posted that. Um you know, you can leave us a review. That really helps us out. Or consider supporting us on Patreon. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank uh, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about computer vision? If you want to talk about c- computer vision, you can find me everywhere across social media at Don't Panic UX. All right. Special thanks to Jeff Olson each and every week for video editing. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. It depends.